Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and today we're going to be talking about a subject dear to my heart. And that is the fact that in Chinese medicine, we have to be able to digest our lives in order to feel peaceful and grounded and connected to the present moment. The organ system responsible for that, for digesting our life experience, is the same organ system responsible for digesting our food. And that is what we call the spleen and stomach or the earth elements in Chinese medicine. So just this week has been really awful here with the the mass shooting in Las Vegas. There's just been a, a lot of tough tragedy to digest that the people without drinking water in Puerto Rico, just all sorts of, of challenges in digesting the world that I've been hearing about in clinic. And so I thought today, uh, as I had, had an opportunity to talk to a fellow Chinese medicine practitioner, another nationally certified licensed acupuncturist like myself, that we'd really get into how the connection between the digestion of our food and the digestion of life. My guest today is Sarika Cernahaus. And she is someone, she she practices in Arizona. She's a best-selling author of The Funky Kitchen, and she's a natural wellness strategist with a personalized weight optimization and lifestyle upgrade program called The Lapis Method. You can check her out online at naturallylivingtoday.com. I've just met Sarika a few minutes ago and just mm-hmm. I, I just immediately feel like we are um, like sisters on a mission. So Sarika, thanks so much for, for responding to my call for podcast guests in our, in our uh, Facebook group or we know each oh. other. Thanks so much for, for joining me here today. <laughs> Brody, I'm so happy to be here. You know, as acupuncturists, practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine, we are still kind of a rare breed and it's super wonderful to connect and to be able to kind of triangulate, you know, this incredible wisdom that we have educated ourselves on and share it with, you know, your listenership. So thank you so much. I'm glad it worked out for us to come together. I know there's a growing number of us who are taking things outside the clinic walls and trying to mainstream this knowledge, because I know that it's just really democratizing what used to be just like mountaintop wisdom, you know, or like translated across, you know, you don't really have to speak Chinese to know this anymore. That's you, know, right. you don't have to go to acupuncture school. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's, let's dive right into it. I, I'm curious mm-hmm. as to what, why it's so important for us to, to get back to traditional methods of food preparation in order to digest. Like I know you've got this book, The Funky Kitchen, and, mm-hmm. and that you go into that a bit. And so I'm curious, like you obviously saw that as, as an important thing that people needed to know enough to want to write a book on it. And so, <laughs> so, so let's talk about that. It's an interesting thing. Um, Right now, after 17 years of being in practice, I decided to go back and get my doctorate in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And uh, one of my courses, we're kind of having to to dive deeply around something that's of interest to us in our practice. And for me, not surprisingly, it is the role of nutrition and specifically the role of traditionally prepared foods. And as I pulled this information together for this course, I am having to kind of come to terms with why that means so much to me. And really what it comes down to is that Chinese medicine is a 5,000 year old practice, structural practice. And when we look at the information related to prescription for points and for herbs and lifestyle and whatnot, I think it's almost a given that the practitioners wouldn't have necessarily been speaking about food preparation techniques because it would have just been what everyone was doing. You didn't have to say like, don't use Teflon pans and like (laughs) stop microwaving. And (laughs) it was like, or or like actually cook your food because there was no option to do anything else. Right. (laughs) It's so true. And that's it. And it's one of those things that in this incredible capacity of what uh, the compendium of Chinese medicine offers us, I really do feel like it's a foundational piece. um, And yet it's not really discussed. 
I mean, in our nutrition classes, I know we both, even though we went to different schools, I, I know we both learned about um, something called a kanji, which is a long cooked kind of grain soup. And we would hear about, you know, how healing marrow could be and this sort of thing. But yeah, the practice of the cooking techniques were just part and parcel with what we did. One of those things um, is fermentation and culturing. And, you know, today that's a very hot topic. It's something that's very popular, you know, krauts and kombucha and all this. But it's something that um, until, you know, the last 100, 200 years or so was actually a really important food preservation technique. And these were just methods that people use to get the most out of the effort they had put into the food that they were preparing. I mean, that is something that we are so far removed from in the 21st century where we don't grow our food, we don't raise our animals, we don't go hunt. And for those people that do, they certainly have that deep appreciation for what it means to hunt an animal, take it down, to prepare it, you know, for consumption, or to rear an animal, you know, on like a hobby farm or something. That's a lot of effort. And especially to do it right, um, so that the animal's in its best shape. And then certainly, you know, growing produce. Yeah, it's These a big are, deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And we are so out of touch with the effort that that is. And if we were more in touch with it, we would be much more inclined to not let any of it go to waste. And so that's what these traditional techniques allowed people to do was to make the absolute most of everything. And the thing that's really cool about that, that we're understanding now from the perspective of what we're able to do with research is that we're able to see that this, this practice of not letting anything go to waste actually was a, a way to get other types of nutrients into our body that um, quite honestly, as a species, we have evolved to expect in our diet because of this practice. And yet they are things that people are not doing. And so from a biological genetic perspective, we are holding the bag on what, what our body is expressing us because we are not feeding it what it is designed to eat. Okay. I, I really, I'd love to just pause you there and ask yeah. you to go more specifically into yeah. what are these nutrients that our bodies are right. have evolved to expect that we're dropping the ball on giving them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one thing I'm happy to talk about is broth. Um, you know, bone broth, it's funny, you go into LA Times, New York Times, you know, everything's all about bone broth. And um, and, and with good reason, right? Like for people who might not be hip to the trend, bone broth right. is getting pressed for a lot of reasons. I mean, primarily I see it because I treat so many people with autoimmune diseases, with mm -hmm. digestive issues where the gut is inflamed. And yeah. bone broth is a way of, it's like, it's incredibly soothing and it's incredibly healing. And it's incredibly easy to digest, you know, and, but for, for people who might not be afflicted with these conditions or like mm -hmm. where like the bone broth trend might not be so in vogue, let's go into why. And from a Chinese medicine standpoint, the fact that it comes from just the depths of the oh. bones, right? It's like that <laughs> resonates with what we call the Jing in Chinese medicine or the Correct. deepest part, deepest layer of essence that we have. Like, or that if we think about our qi is the energy that we use every day, the Jing is this deeper layer underneath it. And it's kind of the core of who we are. It's like the pilot light of the whole system and like increases like. So when we're accessing mm -hmm. the Jing of an animal, if we're, if we're taking the carcass of a chicken or something like that and, and cooking it down into a broth, we're extracting this, this deep life-giving essence that's helping us not to waste it. Sorry, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of going no off way. for you, but, I, but I, I want to hear from you. <laughs> You're the expert <laughs> no. here. But, no, 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 no. Yeah, but yeah. see, this is a beauty. I mean, like you didn't write the book on traditional food preparation, but this is a beauty of Chinese medicine. It allows us to see the world. I just think with such a broader lens, Ends. And so I love that you just totally spoke my language. And if I ever break my hand, I'm going to call you to, you know, write for me because <laughs> um, <laughs> you know exactly where I'm coming from on this. I hope it's conveying to everybody. 
This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by my Basics of Chinese Medicine course. You probably know your Myers-Briggs type and your astrological sign, but do you know your Chinese element? Knowing your element can help you recognize your superpowers, your innate gifts, and how to maximize them. It can also help you avoid becoming a caricature of yourself. But better yet, when you understand your constitution, you can start to get to know which acupoints, meridians, foods, tastes, and activities are going to be medicine for you. And that, my friend, opens up a whole new world of self-care. Basics of Chinese Medicine is an eight-week deep dive into understanding your inner ecosystem. Registration is now open and we start October 18th. You'll learn how to confidently locate and use some of the most powerful acupoints and some essential oils that pair well with them, how to eat with the seasons, how to tell what a food or an herb does by how it tastes, as well as each internal organ's mystical powers, its emotional and psychological functions. To register, visit BrodyWelch.com, that's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H, and grab your spot. The broth is really an interesting thing, and you're so right, Brody. It's something that just gives so much without asking much of us in return. And, you know, to have a homemade chicken soup, something that's made from the whole carcass of a healthy chicken, um, that is something that uh, even if a person is not afflicted with various autoimmune presentations, like that just tastes good. Uh, there's something about that that we resonate with. We just know that that is something mighty fine for our body. And so that is, that's, that's it. And you nailed it with talking about the Jing essence of, of, the, of the animal. In a Western um, perspective, one way that we can look at that is when we look at a muscle cut, say it's like a chicken thigh. The chicken thigh, as we look at it, the muscle part of it is very different than the skin or the fascia that surrounds it or the ligamentous tissue uh, between the bones and the, and the muscle, the cartilage. And we can look at those different components of, of the bird and see that they really are structurally different. Well, with the advent of being able to look at things under a microscope and break things down and discern what it is that each of those is comprised of, when we look at the composition of a bone in terms of like amino acid content, it is wholly different than uh, muscle content. And so what we're allowing for when we create a broth that is made with these different components of the, of the bird or maybe a shank bone with marrow in it, um, what we're doing is we're consuming a wide variety of amino acid profiles. If we get, you know, maybe some liver into that soup or some heart, then we're further increasing the nutrient profile that is in that broth itself. And these are really important pieces. So for instance, when uh, amino acids are just the building blocks of protein. And um, methionine is one of the amino acids which is rich in muscle cuts. But if we consume too much methionine, it actually can be damaging to our body. It can be inflammatory. But there are components that are in the bone itself, in the skin, in the connective tissue. It's another amino acid called glycine that actually helps to buffer the methionine uptake in our body. And so when we look at the whole component there, it actually helps to create something that is better for us in the long run to consume the entire uh, composition as it is there. And so that's just one example of how that oh, can work. And I love that you said that because so often in Chinese medicine, like <laughs> the herb formulas that we make are, yes. are synergistic combinations mm -hmm. that are different than the sort of Western approach of like, oh, curcumin, the ac you know, the active ingredient in turmeric, let's extract it and multiply <laughs> it by 10,000 and supercharge it and like throw it into, in, you know, into this pill. <laughs> As opposed to like, let's actually combine it in a synergistic mm -hmm. way with other mm -hmm. herbs that that bring out similar properties, maybe buffer the harsher effects of it or that potentiate it. You know, it's like turmeric totally. like 2000 times more powerful when it's combined, combined with black pepper or fresh That's ginger. Right. And it's right. the, those kinds of like traditional <laughs> preparations that are like, okay, yeah, the cultures that cook with turmeric, they do this. Like that's just part of oh, curry. Yeah. That's just part yeah. of, of the <laughs> meal. <what> <laughs> Exactly.
exactly. And it's exactly that. That is the really cool thing about these techniques. Um, so, I mean, that's broth and broth is just so fabulous. Um, you know, broth, when it's a good broth that you put into the fridge and it gels up kind of like jello, um, that, that is a sign of the proline and the, and the glycine that are rich in that broth composition. <clears throat> and that's wonderful. But that gelatin uh, that forms from that, that actually has what's called a hydrophilic structure. And that hydrophilic structure is something that draws liquid into it. And so when we eat a gelatin-rich broth like this and say, you know, maybe we make some, some rice with it or we make a bean soup or we just eat soup or we have some broth with a meal, that hydrophilic colloid of the gelatin actually helps to pull more digestive juices into the bolus of food that we've eaten with that broth. And so it actually helps to draw in more of our digestive function into the food itself as we're digesting. Oh, that's it. fascinating. So is it that actually, cool? So that it, so basically, it, it it's it, you can think about it as like an amplifier for our own natural digestive yes. juices, things like yes. that. It'll magnify it. That's so totally. cool. Totally, isn't that the best? Yeah. So that's one wonderful attribute right. there. And the other thing too, you know, it's funny because this kind of reductionistic um, point that you were making about the Western model uh, and how it approaches herbal medicine. Um, I see that happening in the languaging around food too. And um, there was an article I was reading that was saying, hey, is broth everything that it's supposed to be? And there's this really kind of like um, A equals A mentality around it from a Western perspective. And the, and the point that was being made in the article is if you have broth, will it make your skin better? Will it make your hair better? Will it make your gut better? The fact of the matter is, is our bodies are super smart. And what our bodies are always going to do is allocate resources to the places that are most stressed and also most important for our livelihood. Right. And, and the yes. skin and the hair are kind of like last that on the hair. list, you know, yeah, like they they're, are. they're not as important <laughs> as keeping your liver healthy and they're not as important exactly. as keeping your heart beating. And it's totally. like, yeah, or at least things like the hair and the nails that are called the flowers that are associated right. with the different organs. The skin, I think we could argue is an organ of detoxification, but if your skin is rashy or red or erupting, it's like, it's right. a reflection of something on the inside that your body totally. is trying to rid itself of or an, an excess um, heat condition or we, that we might think of in Chinese medicine. Oh, and I know yeah. you know that. I mean, as soon as I see something on someone's skin, I'm like, what's going on inside? I am not thinking about, you know, like, oh, what have you been putting on your skin. I mean, obviously, if someone has contact dermatitis, we've got an issue. But if it's something that has been going on, and we don't have any obvious exterior issues, and it's yes. like, well, we need to look at what's going on inside. Yeah. And so when we do that, and the body, because it's been given like this full complement of fatty acids and amino acids and peptides um, to work with, then the body doesn't have to allocate so stringently. It's, you know, it's got this wonderful pool of materials to work with. And so that's why when a person over time is consuming a nutrient dense diet that includes broth, very often they really do find that their skin looks better, that their hair is growing like a weed, you know, that their nails are strong. Um, it's all of those things. And it's because the body had the structure it needed for keeping the heart working and the brain working and the liver functioning and, and still had some to keep you looking good on the outside. Yeah, nice. So it's really lovely. I mean, that's just so great. Definitely. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about other, other traditional ways of food preparation. Specifically, um, I'd like to ask you about soaking and I'd like to ask you about yeah. fermentation. I'm curious whether are you in the grains are evil camp or the legumes and you know <laughs> lectins and you know like I'm freaking out about ah. about the anti nutrients that these things contain. What, what what do we need to know here? Right, right. Well, in my humble opinion, um, what I see around that is again. It has to do with the quantity issue, it has to do with the quality of, of all the other foods that we're consuming, the quality of our lifestyle as well. Um, but really, it's a quantity issue. And um, 
the foods that people are eating today are going to be more lectin rich on balance because people do tend to be eating a lot more refined grain foods. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that it, and even if one is doing, you know, these gluten free type foods. And, and really gluten is just a lectin. And so right. gluten in, in essence is just a hard to digest protein, right? That's right. exactly what it is. <laughs> so if somebody goes gluten free that, right. and they feel better, it's like, okay, that's, that's a good first step perhaps. And it is. Yeah. I totally uh -huh. agree. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It is, but you know, it's like so many things in life. I mean, the reason I became an acupuncturist in the first place was because of my own health issues. Mm -hmm. And then the reason I dove as deeply into nutrition as I did was because kind of malingering health issues for myself, but then what I saw happening um, in my kids and, you know, we were feeding them this organic, you know, pasture raised, um, you know, free range, all of it and gluten free. And um, my, I took my son in for a dental appointment and he was four and the dentist came out of the room and she said, you know, um, I'm going to have to actually <laughs> extract two of your son's primary teeth. And then the rest of them were going to have to put fillings on. He has got so many cavities. And I was just dumbfounded because we were eating the way I just told you. I'm a natural health care practitioner. We don't use medications in our house. We don't drink soda and, you know, eat huge amounts of candy. None of that. I mean, it was gluten-free, organic, all the good things. Right. And so it was, it was really a wake up call to me of what am I missing here? Because I'm definitely missing something. And we were spending a ton of money on groceries. I can imagine so, that would have been shocking, right? Like, oh, like it, you're, you're doing ah. all this and like, <laughs> wow. Okay. And so humbling. It's like, oh dear. And you know, cause I mean, you just, you don't expect when you're doing all those things that things are going to go sideways and it totally did. And I know a lot of people would look at that and think, okay, well, I've just got to get after the brushing better for him or, you know, something like that. I just knew I had this principle of allocation of resources that was tinkering around in my brain. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I did the deep dive. And part of the deep dive um, was pulling grains from our diet. And then the rest of the carbohydrates we were eating, you know, it was sweet potatoes and no, well, sweet potatoes. We had a lot of them in <laughs> squash, things like that, um, which are lectin rich. But I feel like we really needed a break from the processed, uh, very carbohydrate rich, uh, gluten free organic foods we were eating. And when I did go to bring back in the grains, we first started with non gluten bearing grains. Um, but I, I began using the principles of pre-digestion and soaking is one of those techniques. And then um, adding in fermentation to that takes it even further. And so, you know, it was rice, maybe quinoa and quinoa actually is super high in lectins. And so I'm glad that all along, before I really tapped into lectins, I, I'm glad I always soaked our quinoa. If lectins are a new concept for people, is there anything else yes. that they need to know other than that, that they can be hard to digest? Well, they can be hard to digest, exactly. And, and as, that, as that continues to increase in the body, it can lend itself toward a pattern that's called leaky gut syndrome. And that is something that that really, you could go to WebMD. I'm not saying some kind of left field alternative concept here. No, not at all. Not at all. And so this is something that's recognized. Western medicine takes a position of it's not very well understood, but it does exist. Alternative medicine um, is coming at it from the perspective of we have a pretty good idea on the causes of this. And I would say that most practitioners would agree that it is not a matter of if you have le leaky gut syndrome, but a matter of how badly you do have it. Because there are so many factors that play into people struggling with this today. Which is essentially, right, like just gut permeability leading to things from our mm -hmm. digestive tract that are showing up in the bloodstream that then mm -hmm. are, that shouldn't be there. That drains the body's resources as we have to go after these and, yeah. and get rid of them. 
Exactly. And it lends itself towards autoimmune presentations yeah. because many of these proteins and carbohydrates that get into the bloodstream that have not been properly humanized, have not been properly digested, and instead of kind of leaked out into the bloodstream, these structures uh, to our immune system can look very much like our own tissues and they can even dock on our own tissues. And so the body in its attempt to clear the body from these, these issues in the bloodstream starts it's going after its own tissues. And that's how it is that something like, you know, Hashimoto's or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, these can be connected to the diet. And so lectins are a huge player in uh, the prevalence of this. The Basics of Chinese Medicine, Your Inner Ecosystem is an eight week learn from anywhere course that will demystify acupuncture and Chinese medicine. By the end of the course, you'll be able to begin to align your lifestyle and diet with daily and seasonal rhythms so you can digest better, have more energy, and stay healthy, and determine which systems in your body tend to be out of balance and how you might tend to them with lifestyle, diet, acupressure, and more. Each week, you'll get 20 to 30 minutes of an audio lecture so you can listen in your car, at the gym, while you're washing dishes, or wherever. Fun quizlets, reflection questions, and exercises to reinforce the material you're learning. Plus, you'll get three 60-minute group phone calls with Brody so you can ask questions, discuss new concepts with classmates, and learn in a group setting. Go to BrodyWelch.com and click on Basics of Chinese Medicine under the Learn From Home tab to find out more. Classes start October 18th, so reserve your spot today. So if someone is out there having struggling with digestive issues, yeah. do you, would you recommend that they start by soaking their grains or their pseudo grains mm -hmm. like quinoa or eliminating them entirely? Or like, I know that as I think about when someone has, is not digesting well, just going back to super basics and that's going to yeah. include, you know, from the Ayurvedic tradition, something like kitchari, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of basmati rice, mung dal and digestive spices, soups, right. stews, broths, things like that. What's yeah. your, what's your go-to first step? And then of course, you know, people are often confused when they're like basmati rice, isn't that refined? Shouldn't I be, you right. know, and then it's like, okay, know. right. But you know, you can't make use of what you can't digest. And so getting yeah, a handle right. on digestion first, and then mm -hmm. coming up with a diet that's not going to whack out your blood sugar in the long haul. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting balance. I mean, and that's one of those things, Brody, and you know it when you know you have someone you're working with, it's like, okay, tell me where you are. And then where you see that person, that's where you have to decide where you can begin to help them make adjustment. Yeah. So um obviously processed foods um are like the first thing that need to go. Um, but I think one of the other really important things too is the complexity of meals that I see people eating. Um, that also is a challenge to the digestive function and also the frequency with which people are eating. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Like just because yeah. remembering again, that the spleen has to mm -hmm. sort out all of these different ingredients. Oh, okay. okay. So what do yeah. I do with this and where do I put this? And, and then, oh, yes. you know, like if the stomach is interested in protein, but you're giving it fruit at the same time, mm -hmm. wow, that is like that, you know, the fruit's <laughs> just going to sit there and like causing and a does. fermentation issue. So we, we think about simplifying and especially like when life gets complicated or at the change of the seasons, it's so good mm -hmm. to just get simple. It is. It's super like, for instance, today, you know, I've, I've got this homemade bread that we have and I just made that with some sauteed veggies and a couple of eggs. And many people would say that's still too complex. And there was a period in my life when it might have been. But the bread that I make, you know, I soak and ferment it for almost two days before we even cook it. Wow. Um, and so, that is, what do you make it yeah. out of? Well, we rotate through different grains. Mm -hmm. And so, so right. Okay. So back in the day when Grant was little, um, you know, we took that year off and we cut out the grains. And when I brought them back in, back in, they were not gluten bearing grains. And, and my husband's family does have celiac issues. And so I, I was like, well, we'll just pull them. So I was just kind of thinking that's how we were going to live. And so when we brought back in the grains, rice and stuff like that, I just soaked and fermented it and then I'd cook it. And, um, and everybody seemed to be doing okay. And I was really surprised at how much more full we felt with a little bit of grain properly prepared, um, you know, from meal to meal. And so then I thought, well, 
you know, as I'm studying this and I see what the fermentation does and the soaking does, it seems to me that we could probably use these techniques to also break down gluten because it's also just a protein. And so I started working with gluten bearing grains and um, also was looking at the research around that and sure as heck enough, it's true. And so what we started working with were non-wheat uh, or at least derivations of wheat, I would call it. So we kind of rotate through five different grains. I use spelt, kamut, einkorn, emmer, and rye. And just for diet variation's sake, I, I'll just make a different loaf of different things at different times. And that is what we consume. The thing I remember <laughs> when I first made a sandwich with my early incarnation of this type of bread and at the time, I was really kind of eating more paleo, so a lot more protein than I'm currently eating. And it was kind of a gut buster looking sandwich. I mean, it was, you know, some raw cheese and some, you know, properly processed pastured meats and some veggies on there. And then it was in this bread that I'd made. And it was the sort of thing that I think um, had it been kind of American versions of those ingredients, it would have just really beat me up. Um, but surprisingly enough, because we did all of this activity on the grain itself and pre-digested it, it digested like a salad. I mean, it was amazing to me. And so, so you know, you get the rubber meets the road kind of like we're living this experience with it and then you go and share it with others and you see that others are doing well with it and you read the research and it's like, huh, yep, exactly. These are like completely, totally important things that people are not doing and they're truly the, the missing link in vitality for so many people. And when we use these techniques, it allows us to take foods that are rich in lectins like beans and grains and work with the breakdown of that protein structure so that we can consume these foods. And so I'm not a fan of people eating lectins to the degree that they are in most situations, but it's okay. I mean, if we just do these, these super simple methods, then it's not a problem anymore. So then we get our cake and eat it too. Wonderful. <laughs> so how long does it take to ferment a grain? If somebody wants to like <laughs> right. considering getting, making in their own bread, which, which um, I don't know if, if you've read uh, John G. Yard's Eat Wheat book, Oh no! Yeah. Well, he ta he mentions, and maybe this is even in his blogs and stuff. But um, in the research, I remember reading that that in a in a traditionally raised loaf of sourdough, there might not be any gluten, even if it's made with with uh, gluten containing grains, because in the process right. of fermentation, it is digested, which it I is. thought was was really interesting. Um, and that's as what I, we're talking yeah, about. as I definitely struggle <laughs> with digestion and, and digestive issues and am very curious about whether or not I need to be avoiding these things for the rest of my life or not. Correct. And, you know, I guess for me, part of that gets into the joy of life mm -hmm. and yep. um, feeling like you're part of it. You know, talk about an earth issue, feeling yes. grounded, you know, I and mean, connected and connected. It's huge and supported, right? Like you're, it's yes. like one thing to be like, okay, well, I want to be part of this experience. So I'm going to eat whatever I want with my family. I like, that's not what I'm talking about because no, then, then you don't feel nourished. If you can't digest it, you feel like crap. And then it's just yeah. like, and it's actually fundamentally not taking care of ourselves. No, it's not. And yet at the same time, I think that one of the best signs of improved health is the capacity to go do that with people from time to time sure. and then have it not harm you in, you know, I mean, sure, things like that. It's not. And when I say from time to time, I really do mean randomly. But, um, you know, when you are doing the thing that works for your body, then it gives you that flexibility. It gives you that capacity. And on those experiences, when that happens, if I'm out to eat or, you know, at a friend's house or something, I just look at the meal and I say, I am just expanding my nutritional capacity right now. Right and that's really what mm -hmm. I'm doing. I don't get all hung up about it. <laughs> and then yeah. I feel fine too, you know? Well, like, and part of that is that you're digesting the experience, right? Like, it, yes. well, if you're thinking to yourself, this is going to poison me, then it's, I know. it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There is no 
joy in that. And so yeah. to me, that's a great marker of that type of, you know, uh, even at a cellular level, we'd call it mitochondrial flexibility. And so that is super, super important. Um, so right. And this is the thing, Brody, this is where we can dovetail into really looking at the traditional perspective on things. We have to also look at the energetic quality of the food that we're consuming. And I am a very Vata person. Um, and so from the Ayurvedic perspective, you know, that's thin, it's airy. I need to have foods that kind of weigh me down and hold me down. You, Yeah, you struggle to feel grounded and, and yes. stable. Like there's a lot of movement in your life. There's a lot of air, yes. air and ether elements. That's exactly right. So you take that type of person and that's the type, that's a constitutional body type that, that could do with some weighing down of the grains. And, and when we look at it from a biomedical perspective, grains are rich in a wide spectrum of B vitamins. And so that helps with the adrenal health. Um, and then someone like me does even better if you put a ton of grass-fed butter onto that rice or onto that piece of bread, you yes. know, sort of like <laughs> anchor. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is, you know, that works for my body type. And for my son, he's built so much like me. He has, that works awesome for him too. For my daughter, she's more muscular than I ever was. And, she, you know, she just doesn't need that intense nutrition that Grant and I need. And so I think that that's, that's a little bit of the finessing that we have to look at um, when we do look to incorporate these much maligned foods. And the thing I'd say about that too, Brody, is that <clears throat> if, if you're going to bring back in these foods, one, make sure that you're preparing them you know, this way and with the best ingredients and don't have them be part of a complex meal. I've seen people, you know, who are more kapha type, mm -hmm. um, who say, oh, I can't eat grains. No, no, no. And they, and they have some of my bread and they think they're okay. And then they're not. But I'm like, but look at all the other stuff that you were eating it with. You didn't even give it a chance. Yeah. I mean, that was way too much complexity. Yeah. So for, so for someone who tends to carry extra weight, who puts on weight yeah. easily, for someone who who's very stable and grounded, who has a lot of that earth element or a lot of the earth and water element is, is more like the kapha type or the earth type in Chinese medicine. That for yes. those people, they have to really be careful as to not overdo the mm -hmm. the sweet taste and the grainy stuff, especially the gluteny stuff, which tends to yeah. be sticky and sticky. and sticky means it's accumulative, right? Like it, yes. it helps to build. Yes, it's it does. And there's already plenty of building that's happening right. for these exactly. folks. They don't need that. So just a little bit, but definitely for those people using, you know, having it be pre-digested through the soaking and fermentation awesome. process. Sarika, yeah. I wish we could just keep talking. I know, and we could talk all day. I might have to have you back for another episode, <laughs> okay. but but unfortunately we are getting short on time here. So I wanted to I just, um, first of all, thank you for sharing all this awesome information and to ask you where people can connect with you if they want to continue learning from you or perhaps get your book or be able to work with you. Oh, thank you, Brody. So my website, my main website is naturallylivingtoday.com. On there, I'll have a little subheading for the Funky Kitchen and for the Lapis Method, which is my lifestyle coaching program, weight optimization program. But um, if someone wants to just go straight to the Funky Kitchen material, then that's just simply funkykitchenfresh.com. And I have a little webinar there, um, just some of my favorite ideas and tips on saving money and how to bring, you know, more whole food nutrition into the kitchen. So I would say that's, those are probably the best ways. My book, The Funky Kitchen is on Amazon and um, that's how to find me. Wonderful. Sarika, thank you so much for thank taking the time you. to chat with me today. It was super fun. Thank you, Brody. Take care. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.